Good day, Grinder School. This is Nodeg, and we're carrying on with uh, How to Master Heads Up Sit and Goes, uh, Volume 8. Here we're going to be concentrating on the end game. Uh, this video continues off of Video 7, uh, which explains Nash equilibrium and the Skolansky Chubikov uh, charts and gives an idea of how we are going to modify our strategy uh, based on those approaches. So if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend it. But if uh, you already have an understanding of both uh, Sklansky Chubikov and uh, the Nash equilibrium, um, you should be able to follow along. All right, so we're going to talk about a baseline preflop strategy. Um, and when I say baseline, I'm basically uh, going over what you would do readless at this stage in a tournament which is going to be covering uh, 25 big blinds or less you should have some reads on your opponent but uh, granted your villains ranges will change at this stage of the game um, and then we're going to talk about uh, of course baseline post flop lines and again same things apply so we may deviate from these lines in situations where we have reads that dictate we should but uh, other than that we're going to stick with them we're also going to talk about changes of ranges as we get to 16 big blinds or less. And uh, we'll also be talking about um, life support, eight big or sorry, 12 big blinds or less. Um, 12 big blinds to 8 big blinds is generally actually not necessarily out of the game, uh, depending on how many times you have to double up to win anyway. Um, but uh, in any case, we're going to call that our life support levels. So, um, alright, so starting with preflop from the small blind or the button, um, we're going to be opening a wide range still. You can see here that uh, the small pocket pairs, two through fives, uh, I don't have included in our open range, and that's because we're just going to be open jamming them. Um, some people, uh, there are some situations where we may just be min raising uh, fours and fives. Um, but uh, those are mostly in situations where we feel that uh, we're going to basically be stealing the pot pretty easily uh, post-flop a majority of the time. Um, and also uh, with twos and threes, there's no real better way to play them than to open jam them. Um, because those are both uh, pretty clear shoves, uh, Sklansky, Sklansky uh, Chubikov shove range and um, although the twos are close at 25 big blinds, but um, b because Sklansky Chubikov assumes that our villain, our opponent actually knows what we have, I think we can easily shove the twos a little bit wider um, with no problems whatsoever. So we're going to be flatting any three bets with a pretty tight range in general, uh, ace five plus, king nine plus, queen nine plus. Um, and as a default, and that's to a three times uh, three bet, um, and even then probably queen nine suited. Uh, that's if it we get an exact three x uh, three bet. We can widen that slightly with um, w if they have a lower uh, lower three bet of say uh, two and a half big blinds or two point two five big blinds. But uh, in general, we want to keep to a pretty tight range. And we're going to be 4-bet jamming uh, readless with 6s plus, ace-8 plus, suited or not. And going into the big blind. If I can get this whoop, thing to cooperate. All right, so um, in the big blind, this is our, our flatting range right here. You can see that... Um, the baby aces um, we are calling by default instead of jamming. You can probably profitably or at least break even uh, re-jam these, but there are a lot of advantages uh, to having aces in your flatting range, even out of position, uh, simply because it conceals your range a lot and um, against the thinking opponents they will often, uh, often be able to um, once they see you show up with an ace like this, it, it gives you a lot of bluff potential later on. Um, in any case, I think that from 21 to 25 big blinds, it is still better to flat these rather than rejam. And after that, we're definitely going to be rejamming them. Um, 
the rest of these were, were flatting. This is a fairly conservative big blind range. You can expand this slightly, especially on the suited side, um, once you, uh, if you're really confident in your post-flop play. Um, 25 big blinds, once we're at that level, um, we have a 4% loss every time we fold our but our um, blinds, so we definitely have to be defending there a lot more often. And uh, uh, that's probably one of the bigger challenges to heads up play for people who aren't used to the format. Um, as you can see though, uh, our calling range is still fairly wide as it would be deeper. And um, we're going to be three betting anywhere between two and a half to three times with uh, jacks plus, ace jack plus. And our larger raises in general are going to go with the ace x hands and our smaller uh, bets are going to go with the uh, jacks plus and any bluffs we decide to throw in our range. There is also the option of throwing in a 2.25x 3-bet uh, if you want to start including hands in your 3-bet range, such as um, um, king-queen, uh, king-jack suited, and the like. Uh, also, it allows you to widen your bluff range considerably. We would mostly be doing that against uh, either nitty players or people that are calling just way too wide. Um, we can do that for value. We throw in a 93 bet with uh, hands like king, queen suited for value or king, jack suited. Um, but at the same time, right now we're keeping our 3 bet strategy very simple, so relatively nitty. Um, and we're going to be 3 bet jamming a7 plus. Uh, or a7 up to ace 10 obviously as well as uh, twos through tens we're going to jam over limps with any small pairs uh, but overall we're only going to be raising limps with good holdings um, ace x king 9 plus queen 10 plus jack 10 so either uh, hands that are really good or hands that hit the flop really well like jack 10 queen 10 um, We'll call open jams with uh, any pair above five and ace eight plus um, in general. And this is all readless, of course. Now, post flop from the button, a key strategy that we're always going to try to do is we're going to try to C bet a ton. Um, usually, our C bets are going to be half pot, but um, and we're going to be looking for uh, spots to barrel. Uh, we can C bet smaller on dry boards. Sometimes we'll be doing this to induce against. Um, more aggressive opponents. These uh, dry boards include things like pair boards or uh, hands that are like king, six, two, rainbow, that sort of thing. Um, and we would probably be doing that kind of C bet with a lot of our value hands too, since uh, we will very seldom be expecting to get a call. Uh, and a very important thing is the small blind is to make sure that you get value whenever possible. Um, and try to set up for a shove whenever appropriate. So the get value thing is really important. S uh, look for spots where even when you have a second to the nuts hand, where you're, you can uh, potentially push the uh, push the pot up uh, farther. Always look for a chance to get a couple extra chips. Um, probably the hardest part about this game is trying to uh, at this level. Once you get to the stacks, uh, is really just trying to get thin value from your opponent's weaker holdings. Um, on boards, especially when you hit hard. Um, another important thing too is to check back only on wet boards, uh, and these are usually with hands that can't take a raise, like middle pairs, stuff like that. And we're going to be jamming over check raises with any decent draw, because uh, uh, readless we can assume that the check raise range will have a enough bluffs in it to make it worthwhile. So any uh, flush draw, straight draw, that sort of thing. Uh, particularly with overs, definitely. Now from the big blind, we're going to play our draws very aggressively as well. Uh, we're going to check raise a ton. Uh, pretty much any draws that we have, real size the check raise is smaller um, if we have any sort of showdown. So if we have middle middle pair and uh, a flush draw, for example, um, because the hand is a relative monster on most boards, uh, we're definitely going to try to size the check rate smaller hoping to get shoved over top. We're also going to be donk betting uh, wet boards with our weaker draws like gut shots. Um, of course when we have to 
against villains that might perceive this as a weaker range. We can also start balancing this range by doing the same thing with top pair type hands. Um, and top pair uh, hands in general, we're definitely going to be playing very aggressively. So um, we're, we're hardly ever going to slow play them in general. Um, and we're probably going to be leaving out. We might change the size of our betting and everything, but we're always going to try to give value out, and um, we're not going to be afraid to check raise. In fact, pretty much our default, even with uh, two pair um, set type hands, uh, straights, flushes uh, on the flop, we're definitely going to check raise, unless it, it seems astronomical that our villain's range would have hit it at all, but um, slow playing has a tendency to be very transparent, especially with the image that we are likely to have, so we have to uh, um, try balancing that out and hoping that we get spewed upon by um, by just playing these aggressively and keeping our aggressive image hopefully allows us to get induced against, um, but in general we we will get paid by a surprisingly large uh, a wide amount of hands, so uh, we definitely want to play our top pair plus type hands very aggressively. Check raise. And uh, again, it should be noted too that we're check raising both with our draws and with our top pair hands. Um, so this naturally balances itself out to a degree, although most of the draws we're playing aggressively with were going to be a uh, flipper better um, when called. So as the game goes on, our ranges are going to change. We're going to start three bet shoving wider for value. Um, and also our three bets are going to start becoming shove only. Um, uh, basically, as soon as we hit 20 big blinds, we're going to mostly going to be three bet jamming and um, only in very specific situations um, against particularly nitty opponents. For example, are we going to be three betting? Um, and even then we have to be very careful with our sizing because uh, it's very easy to get into a situation where it's not profitable to three bet fold. So in general, um, we're definitely going to be three bet jamming, and of course we can make. Uh, we will still be making smaller three bets uh, against fish, with uh, with monsters, hoping to induce. Um, we're going to be jamming over limps a little bit wider as we get shallower. Um, our value range is going to increase, and we're going to call uh, open jams a bit wider um, as as we get down to. Um, and again, this kind of two degree relates a lot to uh, to the Nash calling range, but of course everything we do is going to be a lot wider, than, or sorry, a lot uh, narrower than the Nash the Nash calling range, simply because we can expect villains to be a lot tighter than Nash. So there's no reason for us to uh, to have to play that loose. Um, we're going to be flatting a lot less, um, and we're going to be raising less. Um, will as a default reduce our um, our raising range, our min raising range, um, and throw a lot of it into open jams. Um, we're going to be calling three bets a lot less and um, and basically that means um, not to be confused with calling open jams wider because we are, but we're not going to be calling um, smaller three bets uh, very often. We're more likely to jam over top of them or fold. Um, and we're definitely going to be punishing limps a lot less too, um, which is actually evened out by the fact that our normal punishing, uh, so bumping up of limps, is going to be covered by our jamming range. It's all going to start merging with that. Um, under 16 big blinds, we're going to widen our value three bet jamming range. Um, by frequent betting here, I mean um, anything like 67% or higher, uh, s you could probably, uh, actually you can definitely include Queen 9 suited and Jack 10. Uh, if we're up against villain villains that are have a 75% or higher range, then we should definitely be 3-bet uh, jamming those for value. Um, once we get to 16, under 16 big blinds, and we can also take hands from the bottom of our calling range as per um, my 3-betting video. Uh, the uh, we, we can throw that into our jam range as a bluff. 
And um, once we get the 12 big blinds, we're no longer going to be speculating with uh, city connectors like 8-9, uh, that sort of thing. So we're just going to be jamming them. Um, whenever I mention things that are going to be jammed as a bluff, and 8-9 suited, even 12 big blinds is a bit of a, is a, bit of a bluff. Um, it should be noted that you don't have to always do it, but it, uh, 12 big blinds is definitely fine um, against anybody, unless they hit, they're knitting it up, um, in which case uh, you might just fold them um, just based on the range. But it's highly unlikely you'll run into spots like that. All right, so life support, um, for the purpose of this training, uh, we're going to consider Nash, uh, our Nash range, 12 big blinds or less. Um, in general, I, I don't think it's very profitable to start Nashing before 12 big blinds. Um, uh, there are some situations where we won't be Nashing at all uh, at this, which I'll talk about in a sec, but in general, um, the Nash tables, 12 big blinds or less, we're going to uh, start open jamming or folding. Um, again, uh, against really nitty villains, and keep in mind that a villain that was nitty for the first three quarters of the game, once he gets down to 12 big blinds, may no longer be nitty, so be aware of that as well. Um, it'll often take you a match or two to really uh, define whether or not you can get away with this. But you can definitely continue to bet fold a lot of this stuff, um, a lot of the Nash range. Uh, you can also, um, and that's again only if they're predictable, um, and we can limp fold versus villains that it'll give up a ton on the flop. And of course, um, we're going to take our stronger, the stronger part of our Nash range, and we're going to try to bet call or limp call versus aggressive villains. And uh, we're never going to do this for flips. So what I mean by this, and I talked about this in one of my uh, videos before this series, you should never take a hand like 2-2 uh, and try to induce with it. And same with uh, Ace-3. Um, just because anything that calls you, uh, or anything that jams over top of you is is probably still a flip, or is a flip, or better. Um, so even if they decide to uh, be induced by your limp, you're getting hands like say um, six five five six suited, uh, jamming over top of a pair of twos, um, and now you're a flip. And uh, they probably would have folded if you just jammed. So always keep that in mind that the part of our range that we are going to be bet calling or limp calling with is the top of our range and um, and our limp fold range so um, or our bet fold range as the case may be uh, so essentially only our really good hands the top of our range um, and of course this top of our range will widen based on how much we expect to be spewed at when we do a bet call or a limp call um, and again, once we get the eight big blinds, we're not going to mess around um, against really bad players. Uh, it's still probably fine to uh, limp in aces or kings. Um, it's fairly transparent against regs, but even even against regs, it can actually s still sometimes be profitable. Um, and uh, in general, that pretty much covers our entire strategy that we're planning on using for these things. So again, we want to maintain our aggression and try to get maximum value the entire time we're playing. And once we get um, to really low big blinds, we're going to gnash it up unless uh, we find some exploitable tendencies of the villain. All right, so we're going to go over a couple of matches here to uh, talk about um, the application of the theory we've had so far. Um, we're playing against somebody that we played once before, maybe twice, uh, based on the hands that we have there. So we do have a, a few reads on this guy. And uh, this is the kind of board where you can make a um, smaller C bet on. Um, I choose to make a half pot C bet. Um, just because uh, this villain is a bit aggressive and um, against some some players at least uh, f for the first little bit until we get down to about 20 big blinds I'll usually do a half pot bet just because I find at this level uh, 30 chips 
has a tendency to induce sometimes. Um, at the same time, 30 chips, 40 chips are pretty much identical, so I think the difference is probably very marginal. And here um, is a standard spot where somebody has a 3x range. Um, we can assume that their 3x range is often um, a little bit better than their regular range. This isn't always the case, and sometimes um, it's unfortunate that somebody will 3x and will jam and they will fold. But um, in any case, when you have a hand like ace-jack offsuit, uh, you're definitely going to want to get it in here. It's just too strong a hand, and the 60 chips is uh, plenty of reward if he decides to fail. And he had junk. All right, this next match is against a reg. Um, I have him tagged as a decent rig. Um, all right, so he has a slightly bigger than normal betting uh, level of 45 chips. Um, this isn't going to affect our calling range at all at this stage in the game. Here, uh, with our king high, uh, we can consider doing fancy stuff like check raises here, etc. But right now, we're playing pretty uh, straightforward. And actually, there's nothing wrong with trying to float for one street with uh, king high here. Uh, it's relatively standard in a lot of spots, but I decided to be a little bit nitty. And here we get jammed, we're just holding 8-9 uh, suited. Um, again, suited connectors aren't valuable enough to uh, to be able to call a jam at this at this level. Um, and this gets back to just the power of any any cards. Uh, in this format, I mean, in general, 8-9 suited in any format isn't the greatest thing to be call calling jams in, but heads up, uh, it's definitely at this depth it would be a mistake to be calling a jam, even though you do um, better you do better than a lot of hands versus his range, his value range here. Um, in general, in spots where we're going to be trying to get any hand in like 8-9 suited, we're going to want to have some fold equity. And again, we're going to give up on this uh, board, um, standard type board to uh, check raise, although it's a little bit wet, but um, we're trying again trying to stick to the script and play pretty straightforward here. And we're getting pretty dry here, but uh, do a punish here with king-queen. And here we have a gut shot. We're going to uh, do a standard C bet here. Expect a lot of draws to uh, follow along. Although, to be honest, uh, any any villain like this should probably uh, anybody that's a decent reg would, would probably be pounding in the draws right here. So it's highly unlikely he has a ten uh, straight draw with overcards uh, or a gut a gut shot straight draw with overcards, um, flush draw. It, it doesn't seem all that likely. Um, seems more likely he probably has an 8 or 5 here. Um, this is just based on the fact that he's a he's a decent reg and like I I preach, you know, the reason why I preach um, the play draws very aggressively is because it works and most decent regs do, so um, we decide to check back here which I think is fine and when he checks here I think that we can uh, definitely get some value here. Um, the check back on the turn, by the way, is a little bit close. Again, because we don't think he's on a draw, and we think he's on a, an 8 or a 5, we could stab there and check behind on the river. Um, and, and that should be fine, because he's probably going to be calling with 5s uh, and or 8s and probably his 5s, but in a spot like this, we're definitely going to be getting values out of, out of his 5s by betting here. Um, and unfortunately, um, we decide to check back 
which is really nitty. And uh, this is an example of a spot where you should try to get thin value, um, especially when the villain has a range that you can relatively predict, um, such as in this case where he's not going to have any major draw or uh, top pair. Uh, he would have definitely been check raising on a board like that. And we decided to jam in here, uh, pretty standard with a pair of sevens. And we get beat by queens. And here's a match against a relative unknown. On a board like this, we're pretty much getting it in. Um, if we get jabs out here, we just have way too much equity. And we're going to bet again here, just because this kind of board will get flat, flatted by uh, overcards, um, fives, twos, uh, small pairs sometimes, although those should be getting in uh, pre. In any case, um, in any case, we definitely have to, to barrel off there a bit. And standard move here with ace nine when limped two. Um, all right, um, in this board, versus an unknown, again, a, uh, the board pair is here, and I think that it makes it a pretty bad spot to stab in, since most people, um, without any reads, you can assume that they're checked back range. Um, is going to have a lot of uh, second pair type hands or draws. Um, I mean, this board is pretty dry, um, but at the same time, um, I don't think it's really worth taking a stab at, which we do, of course. And here we have to give up. And here we make a uh, smaller C bet here, uh, hoping to induce we get fold of. All right, so we do a two and a half X uh, three bet here with ace queen, and uh, we get to see a flop. Flop is relatively uh, dry with uh, jack high, so. We're going to put a rel uh, pretty much our standard C bet, which is uh, less than half pot, um, 80 chips into 200 here, and luckily we get a fold. And a two big blinds deep. We decide to just get in with ace nine, which is definitely fine. And unfortunately, we get coolered. All right, so here we are again. Um, we've played this guy before. He's relatively moderate, uh, with not a ton of uh, three bets, and doesn't seem to like folding the three bets. So. Um, does a limp call first hand, which is kind of fishy looking at the best of times. Um, when he calls here, you could probably have any heart, um, any straight draw sort of thing. We decide to uh, check here. Um, we're probably calling a bet unless it's a huge one. Um, and we decide to try to check it down just because we, we do have a bit of value. Um, no point in getting thin value since nothing with a worse hand is going to call us at all. Um, and he, he comes in with uh, with a bit of a draw um, that whiffed. So interesting hand, very passively played, always a good sign. And here's an illustration of a hand where we're definitely not going to mess around with his limps with a hand like 6-4 offsuit, especially since we've seen that he can limp call already. Um, we're definitely, we're not even doing it as a bluff. Uh, here we're definitely going to see a street, 
and uh, again we're going to try to check it down um, I find it highly unlikely that he's bluffing here um, at, or at least not not enough that uh, calling here is ever profitable and we do a standard C bet on a dry board we hit a small amount of equity um, just because this guy seems to like calling for a street often enough um, we're definitely going to try to uh, barrel him off here uh, since his range is so wide and there's enough overcards etc that uh, we should be able to give, get him off on a turn barrel plus our equity has increased uh, a little bit here And here's another example of a dry board and a smaller c-bet, exact type of c-bet we would put in for value, by the way. Although, obviously, in this board, there's only so many value hands. And he's tightening up, it seems, uh, now that we're a little bit lower. Um, and again, he doesn't limp call. Um, or sorry, no. Um, I open with uh, Jack Tenney calls. Um, on this board, we're probably getting it in if it comes down to it at this depth. We we can't uh, we can't bet and not call, um, and at the same time, um, we don't want to check back here uh, just because we're getting nothing from it. Um, he's fishy enough that he's probably calling with uh, any of his draws here. And we're definitely getting ace 10 in. And uh, we do pretty good there. So um, that's a good match against a pretty fishy guy there. All right. Um, next match. We get checked back here. Um, the flop is just, in my opinion, too wet to try to take a stab at. Um, since, based on what little information we have on this guy, we, we really can't consider that we're folding out any of his range, so we're not going to take a stab here at all. And uh, we're definitely folding there. And here, I can consider stabbing here, thinking that uh, the odds of him having less value hands are possible, but uh, I don't hate the check back and giving up um, until we have a, play, a bit of a feel for the guy. And normally, I'm going to be calling a min 3 bet, especially at this level, really wide. Um, I just don't consider 9-4 a really good pick for it. And uh, it seems um, a min 3 bet, this guy doesn't have a really high 3 bet percentage based on the small sample we have. So we can assume that uh, he has a monster there a lot of the time. And an uh, offsuit hand that's not very connected, like 9-4 offsuit, isn't going to be a monster killer at the best of times. Oops. And we managed to uh, hold up against Ace King there. Five big blinds, we're jamming Queen Eight. <coughs> we get called by King Five. Um, King Two here, nine big blinds. Uh, I don't think it's good enough to be calling against his jam. And obviously, any pot compare, ten big blinds, we're getting in and losing again. And um, in our history with this guy to this point, we've never seen the guy limp, or maybe once, once before. It's not a huge sample, but um, I don't, I don't think it's worth uh, jamming over top of him here. And uh, 
This is a bit annoying, but we decided to try to take a stab here, and he instantly uh, bumps it up. Uh, that can mean anything, really. Um, the guy seems a little bit fishy, um, and thus unpredictable in some respects. So, um, standard jam here with Ace-5 suited. And we're going to be jamming uh, all of our low aces pretty much. Uh, we're going to probably start at around 20 big blinds, um, but we're definitely going to be jamming them all at around 16 against uh, uh, pretty much any opening range. And the back call with King Queen. Um, we threw in a limp back there. Anyway, uh, just kind of trying to train him to spew a bit at our limps. And uh, I was pretty sure that he would, even at 10 big blinds, would be rejamming uh, pretty light there. So I didn't just open jam it for value like I would against some opponents. Here I limp and get jammed on, which is good. And here we're rejamming with Queen Ten suited, thirteen big blinds for uh, for value. That's a good illustration of why, um, of how we're normal hands that would be a flat uh, become a value three bet uh, once we get lower. An 8-9 offsuit is about as low as I get for uh, for open jamming here. And I unfortunately get called, but I fortunately hit. So a somewhat interesting match. Definitely shows the need for patience in these games, uh, in spite of the quick blind levels. So to conclude this up here, um, the end game is, in my opinion, the most interesting part of these uh, heads-up sit-and-goes. Um, there's a lot of uh, math, calculations, guessing, second-guessing, um, and manipulation of your opponent's raises, um, ranges, rather, and uh, exploiting their ranges as much as possible, um, which is heads-up play in a nutshell. Uh, heads-up sit-and-goes, once they get down to these low blind levels, there's a lot of math involved as well, and it's really easy to uh, to make a mistake just by a slight miscalculation of the villain's ranges. So um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this series. This is uh, the eighth and final volume. Uh, any questions in the forums, I'd be glad to hear them. Thanks very much.